What kind of glimpse into the real life of the Blessed Virgin Mary can we get through the liturgical Marian feast of the church? Stay tuned and find out. Thank you. Thank you and welcome. I'm Father Mitch Packer and welcome to EWTN Live, our chance to bring you guests from all over the world. And our guest tonight is a Dominican priest. He also happens to be the editor-in-chief of Magnificat magazine. And he asks the questions, why does the church venerate the Blessed Virgin Mary according to the particular feast drawn from her life? And what do the mysteries of Mary's life have to do concretely with our own life? Here to help us with the answers is the author of the book, The Mysteries of the Virgin Mary, Living Our Lady's Graces, Father Peter John Cameron, O.P. Thank you. Cameron, welcome. Pleasure to be with you. Thank you. Good to have you here. Thank you. It's a great joy. Good. And where do you live? I live in St. Mary Priory in New Haven, Connecticut. New Haven, Connecticut. You yes. have a large college there, too, Providence College. Well, Providence oh, no, College is about an hour and a half away, yes, but yeah. it's in New England. Yeah, yeah. This is actually on the campus. And those are all small states, so it's not That's so right, far. That's right, right. It takes ten, five, five, ten minutes to go through them. Yeah. But this priory is on the campus of Yale University, actually. Oh, okay. In an old church that houses um, the, the place where the Knights of Columbus were founded, and actually oh, the shrine is that right? to... Venerable uh, Father McGivney is there in our church. Oh, yeah. isn't that great? Michael J. McGivney. Uh, yeah. Was that a diocesan parish when he was there? Or it was, was it the... yes, in the 19th century, formerly was. He was a vicar there. Mm -hmm. And then uh, towards the end of um, the 1800s, it was turned over to the Dominicans. Okay, yeah. okay, great. Yeah. Okay. Well, it's a great legacy to hang on to because yeah. there are so many Knights of Columbus, including myself. Oh, me uh, too, yes. You know, all, all over the, the country and all great over the world. Great order, yeah. Um, I'd like to talk about your book. Uh, it's really uh, very nicely done. It's called Mysteries of the Virgin Mary. And, you know, one of the things I like about it is that it's a rich treasury of a lot of good quotes from fathers of the church mm. and saints. And one of the reasons I like that is it shows that Marian devotion is not your personal bailiwick. That's right. It's not something that you just no. do because you think you're cool. This is, <laughs> right. that may be true too, but this is something that you do and that all of us do throughout the history of the church. And that's, that's one nice thing that as a starting point with your, your text. When I was asked to write the book by the people at Servant Books, they asked what kind of perspective I wanted to take on it. And it was precisely that, that to show the rich legacy of the love for the Blessed Virgin Mary that has been part of the expression of the church from almost the moment that Christ, Christ rose from the dead. Mm -hmm. And not a lot of people have a chance to sit down and read the Fathers of the Church, and so they're missing many wonderful insights about the Blessed Mother that will deepen their own lives of faith. So I, saw, I thought this would be a great chance to compile some of the best of the comments of, of the great spiritual masters, the Fathers and other saints, and put them together in a way that will help people pray the liturgical feasts of Our Lady. Yeah, and one of the nice things about the format is the book is you know, not huge volumes. I mean, some of the, no. some of the works on Our Lady and the Fathers, for instance, are very large yes. because there's so much there. But you sort of called, you know, some of the golden nuggets mm. and put it there in, in, a, in a format that's easy to access. So that's, that's really great. Uh, yeah. I like that. One of the things that you begin with is talking about why we have, you give seven reasons mm -hmm. why we have devotion to Mary. Could you talk at least about some of those? Sure. Well, one of the theories that um, is very important in my own uh, love of the Blessed Virgin Mary and devotion to her is um, 
involves what would what would happen to us if we didn't have the Blessed Mother in our life? Yeah. Now the Holy Father, Pope Benedict XVI, has a, an amazing passage in a, in one of his writings where he's talking about purgatory, and he says, if the doctrine of purgatory were not revealed to the Church, we would probably go out of our way to try to invent it because we would need that so much in our life. We would need the certainty that there is a chance for God's mercy in our life uh, after we die when we haven't had the chance to, to prepare ourselves as perfectly as we would want to for eternal life. And I think the same is true of the Blessed Virgin Mary, that we need her in our life. And if the doctrines of the Blessed Mother weren't given to us, we would go in search of her. We, because there is something about uh, the role that the Blessed Virgin Mary plays in the Christian living out of faith that is absolutely crucial. Well, one, well, one of the things that I, I like about some of the reasons you give is that we didn't need to make it up. That's right. This was something that Christ gave us. And you have a couple of points sure. that you draw from the fact of Christ giving us Mary at the cross. Right. Would you like to discuss that a little sure. bit? Sure. I mean, if you think about it, really the chief reason for having Mary in devotion is because God does. God is devoted to the Blessed Virgin Mary. So uh, now, now that's an odd statement. Not many people have put it quite that way. Uh, God has a devotion to the Blessed Mother. How do you mean that? Well, if you start, if you start from, for example, the Annunciation. So when the angel comes to v visit the Blessed Virgin Mary and he calls her the Blessed, Blessed are you among women. And the fathers tell us that the, the angel says this almost as if it is her name. The angel is the messenger of the heart of God to her. And other fathers of the church say it is as if God is espousing the Blessed Virgin Mary to himself, that there is an espousal happening between the Blessed Virgin Mary and the Holy Spirit, that right. it is almost like a, a marital union that, it, that she is being invited to join in. So it, it shows that even before uh, Christ exists in Mary's womb, there is a, there's a special fondness in the Father's heart for the Blessed Virgin Mary. And that's a fact that has to be taken account of because if God has this, this special love, this tenderness toward the Blessed Virgin Mary, then, then it says something about our, our own regard for her. That if we, want to, um, if we want to be like God, then we have to be like God the way he is in his heart towards Mary. Mm -hmm. So that's the first. Mm -hmm. So at the very beginning of the mysteries, we have the father um, making this proposal of love to this, this virgin girl. And then at the end of Christ's life on the cross, he, the Lord saves the best gifts for the end of his life. So he gives us the Eucharist, the gift of, gift of his very self the night before he dies. And then on the cross, this is St. John Vianney, he gives us his mother. And notice, it is not a, a suggestion that the Lord makes from the cross. He says, behold your mother. It's an imperative. Uh, yeah, behold your mother. It's an imperative. And it's very strange because at that moment, we want to be looking at the cross. We want our eyes fixed on our Savior who is dying for us. And what he's saying to us is, if you want to understand what's happening here, if you want to enter into it, if you want this to become something now that forms your life and transforms your life so that you can be a saint, if you want to be able to receive all the graces that are flowing from the wounds that you see in my side, behold your mother. Because the temptation after Calvary happens is to, is to think that somehow um, we're like Judas, is, is to be overwrought with our own sins, is to be overwhelmed by the horror of Christ's death to the point that we might not want to think about it anymore. But Christ says at that moment on the cross, behold your mother, because she is your mother. And what Christ gives us at that moment from the cross enables us to live the event of of, of Christ dying and rising because we don't do it alone. We do it through the, the graces that are mediated through Mary, our mother. And we can be certain that we're not alone because, because of the command of Christ, behold your mother. One of the other things I liked is the way you discuss how the Blessed Mother also takes initiative. Yes. And you use two examples, how she took the initiative to go to her kinswoman, Elizabeth. Right, yeah. And Elizabeth didn't send for her. No. 
she went because right. she felt impelled. And the same thing with the wedding feast to Cana. She took the initiative. And so that our coming to Mary, in one sense, really has a lot to do with her initiative. Talk a little bit Very about much that. So. I think it's, it's St. Bonaventure, I could be wrong, but he says one of the things that offends Mary the most is when we don't go to her, when we don't right. open up our heart to her. And, and the reality, as you say, is that, is that Mary is constantly coming, and as uh, blessed John Paul II said, placing before us the mysteries of her son. And she does this in an, in an exquisite way, in an, in, in a historical way, at the visitation. So right after the Annunciation, Mary rises and proceeds with haste, we're told, to go to her kinswoman in, in, the, in the hill country of Judah for the visitation. Because this gift now that has taken flesh in her womb is not just for Mary, it is for, for us. And this is one of the principal doctrines, if you will, of all Marian doctrine, that everything that God does for Mary, he does for her for us. Everything that he gives to her, he gives to her with the intention that Mary will share it with us, that she'll mediate it to us. And at every moment then, we see in the Blessed Virgin Mary, Mary looking at our life and providing precisely what we need to be able to live our relationship with God to the fullest. So, in, in the case of the visitation, you have Elizabeth, and she's in a very strange and sort of precarious situation. Here she is an elderly woman conceiving for the first time, uh, and this miracle that is taking place in her womb is something that is, is beyond all reckoning. It's, it's something that is it's unfathomable. And so to give her the kind of comfort and peace that she needs to be able to live out this mystery, God sends Mary into her midst. And as the first sort of Eucharistic procession, there is the Son of God alive in the womb of Mary and the living tabernacle of Mary going to, the, to her kinswoman Elizabeth to give her the, count, the, the, the comfort and the counsel that, is, is, that comes from the Word of God who can't even speak yet. Because we know when, when, when Mary enters into the midst of Elizabeth, the child in her own womb, John the Baptist, leaps for joy. And the fathers tell us that leaping resembles David dancing before the ark, mm -hmm. and it consecrates him in the womb. So that he's born with a, with a purity that uh, sets him on fire to be the precursor uh, of, of the Son of God in the desert. Uh, and so to Cana, the Blessed Virgin Mary is looking at the needs of the guests of the wedding. So she sees that this, there is this lack of wine. And now, because of the presence of her son, because we know that Jesus was invited along with the disciples, uh, a, a momentous event happens in salvation history. The Blessed Virgin Mary recognizes that the most appropriate thing to do with this human need, which is a really a kind of a thirst, is to identify it with her son. And because of Mary's recognizing the need and, and acting as mother, then those many, many, many gallons of water are turned into the most uh, delicious vintage wine. Right, yeah. right. And that's something that, again, she takes on her initiative. Nobody went up to her to no. say, can you talk to your son about this? Or no. I know she... This is her initiative. Yeah. And Dante says in one of the passages in, in uh, the Divine Comedy that, that every grace that comes to us comes through Mary, even before we even know that she's looking at our needs or regarding our lack, she's acting on our behalf. Yeah. yeah. Well, that brings up another point. You, you point out uh, in there how, you know, Mary is co-mediatrix of graces, and that graces come to us through her. Yeah. And you have that wonderful line from St. Thomas Aquinas, that because she is called by the, by, uh, the angel Gabriel, um, the hail full of grace, yes. that that fullness of her grace is something that's the basis for seeing her as the mediatrix of grace. Yes. That is not simply a, a term of praise that the angel is speaking, but 
as, as the fathers say, it's really the Blessed Mother's name in a certain respect. And because of that, because she is, in, in a way, the, the, the personification of this grace, of this holiness, then the fathers from the beginning of, 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 of the church have said that every grace that God wills to give to us, he mediates to us through the Blessed Virgin Mary. Yeah. Why? Because there's something better about a grace that comes from someone else. You know, I mean, if I, uh, one of the saddest things is to go through life with, uh, with the urge to try to be self-reliant. You know, and, there's, and, and sometimes we think that there's a, there's a virtue in that, but there's a much greater virtue in relying on other people to help me be uh, who I can be. Because when I rely on someone else to, to teach me, to educate me, to show me my flaws, to correct me, etc., not only do I gain that wisdom, but then I gained a deeper bond of love with the person who's been my teacher and friend. And this is precisely what God wants to give us through the Blessed Virgin Mary. He not only wants to give us these graces, they could be mediated in many other ways, they could be given directly by them, but He wants us to receive through the Blessed Virgin Mary, that friendship, that bond of love that gives us the certainty that dispels all the loneliness in our life. And mm -hmm. the Holy Father says, this is the greatest misery of the human being. This wretchedness that gives me the sense that I am alone. And in a way, it's, it's what Adam and Eve uh, renounced in the Garden of Eden because they wanted this kind of self-reliance in which they thought themselves to be like God. And in effect, by going after that, they renounce their relationship with God. And so wonderfully, in restoring that to us, God gives us this relationship with the Blessed Virgin Mary so that everything he wants to give to us, he will give to us, but through this woman in whose face and in whose love and in whose maternal care for us, we know that we're not alone. And she, and by that union with her, all the temptations in us that were in Adam and Eve begin to recede because we see it's much better to be united with this beautiful one than to live according to our own self-reliance. Right, yeah. right. Yeah, that's, that's a, a very important uh, element of uh, what you brought in. But at the same time, you also bring up that it's difficult uh, for some people to have devotion to Mary because she's so perfect. Yeah. And, and that some people say, well, I can't relate to that. I remember uh, a professor I had, a New Testament professor, who said, how can we relate to somebody that perfect? You know, we, we, he said, I almost want to put some flaws in her so that I can relate to her better. And I, I remember getting into a discussion with that, about that with him and said, you, you can't put flaws into someone that doesn't have them. But there, there needs to be another way to relate. Yeah. And what about that problem of people trying to relate to her, even though she's more perfect than we are, doesn't that just sort of get, make it hopeless for us? Well, that's why uh, Mary is not the Blessed Virgin superhero. She's the Blessed Virgin Mother. Because I don't know anything about your mother, but I know that you think that your mother was perfect. <laughs> and we all need to think that our mother is perfect, right? Because right. there's something in that experience of my mother being perfect with all of her flaws, with my mother being perfect, that makes it possible for me to be the human being that I have to be. Right. And the thing is, I don't see, and none of us really sees the flaws in our mother. We see the, the, we see the perfection, the perfection of love. We see the way that our mother looks at us. Our mother always forgives us. Our mother won't even let us bring up the things that we've done wrong because it's our, her love for us that is, is the only reality. When we live with somebody who is like that, then um, not only are we not interested in their flaws or, or we certainly don't want to add flaws, but it's, it's what sets us free. So right. this is why Mary is the Blessed Virgin Mother. Yeah. Right. And so in that respect, um, her motherhood is, uh, is, is exactly what we need, as I say, to sort of launch us and to set us free in our life of faith. Yeah. Yeah. No, the, you, yeah. you make some great points at the beginning of, of the book about why we have devotion to Mary. Yeah. But then you go on to talk about the, the, the year of the church's celebrations and how throughout the year various celebrations of Our Lady are done. And you organized it 
according to her life. Yes. Why did you do that? Well, I wanted to introduce people to the Blessed Virgin Mary, thinking that there might be some who would read this book who had never met her before, who really don't know about her life. And the title is, is The Mysteries of the Blessed Virgin Mary. So I thought, well, maybe we should start with the, the seminal mystery, which is the Immaculate Conception. Mm-hmm. And seminal in many respects, not only because it's the moment when Mary is conceived in the womb of her mother, Anne, but also Everything in Marian doctrine in some way goes back to the Immaculate Conception. It's seminal in that way. So I thought if I would lay out the mysteries according to the chronology of the Blessed Virgin Mary's life, it would give them a sense of of how God was acting in her life from the moment she was conceived to the moment that she was taken up into heaven and then what happened after, uh, you know, after heaven. Uh, sure. The coronation and things. Yeah, like you that. have yeah. You, you cover more feasts than we can possibly sure, cover yeah, in a yeah. show like today. Yeah. But um, tell us a little bit more about some of the, some of these feasts. So the seminal feast, I say, is I say, is the feast of the Immaculate Conception, and this feast is so important because when we celebrate the feast, which in this country is a, a holy day of obligation, so obviously it's a very important feast. There's a lot of confusion in people's minds about it. Um, Many times people are confused by thinking that the Immaculate Conception refers to the moment when Jesus was con- right. was conceived in the womb of Mary. So it's. I actually it's heard a young that. priest say that in his first sermon on the Feast of the Immaculate Conception. Really? He was confused. Yeah. And I had to say, well, excuse me, Father, but that's not this feast. <laughs> so, I mean, if that could happen, then it's a sign that it, we we do need to pay a little bit of attention to it. And it, but it's so it's the moment when Mary is conceived in the womb of her mother Anne, and the reading for the Mass comes from the book of Genesis, and it is really the temptation and the fall of Adam and Eve. So somehow the church sees a connection between the fall in the Garden of Eden and uh, this new event, this miracle that happens in, in the womb of the Blessed Virgin Mary. And if you think about what happened to Adam and Eve, in a way, what, if you, what did them in was a conception in this respect. So the serpent speaks to Adam and Eve and begins through the, the sort of the, the poison of his words, gets um, their, their trust in God to become a little shaky. So he says to them, well, the Lord has given you this great paradise, but you can't touch or eat of that tree. And so it's, if that's so, maybe it's because God is afraid of what will happen if you become like God. And so they let this sort of seep into their consciousness, into their mind, and it turns into a, a, a real temptation that, that results in a sin because they decide that it is better to try to be like God in their own way, which is by grasping for this fruit, than by living in obedience and, and believing that God is going to provide everything for them. And so that is the moment that we call the fall. And the Immaculate Conception is God's way of undoing what, um, uh, what happened, undoing the undoing of Adam and Eve in the, in the Garden of Eden. And he does that by, if you will, um, introducing into the world a new conception. Now, this is the conception in the womb of a mother, Mary in the womb of Anne, but it's also a conception in the sense of, of of this little girl is the way that God conceives of his own goodness, of his own beauty, of his own holiness, of his own truth. And now, by offering Mary to us as the mother of God, which will happen when she grows up and makes her ascent to the angel, Now, whenever we're tempted like Adam and Eve to become like God in our own way, God presents, not the serpent, but God himself presents a conception and says, you can be like God, but through my mother, because it is through my mother that I have become flesh, Jesus says. So the more that we give ourselves to the Blessed Virgin Mary and in in the Immaculate Conception, the way that that God undoes all of the the disobedience and all the distrust of of human um, uh, limitation, 
the more we are, we are given that holiness that Adam and Eve wanted, that, that, that image and likeness of God that Ad, Adam and Eve were so hungry for, but in a way that is not sinful, but just the opposite, the way that makes us to be like God according to his own mind. I'd like the people to read what you have to say about the feast of the birth of Mary and the presentation of Mary in the temple. Mm -hmm. um, I'd like to skip over to the feast that is the confusing point of w w with the Immaculate Conception. Let's go over to the feast of the Annunciation. Sure. And let's talk a little bit about when Jesus did become flesh in the womb of the Virgin Mary, which is not this, the, the Immaculate Conception, no. but which is the virgin birth, right. uh, a virginal conception. So why don't you talk about that? Sure. So in the Annunciation, as we were saying at the top of the show, the angel appeared to the Blessed Virgin Mary and spoke to her and um, revealed to her the love of the Father's heart and made this, this kind of a proposal to the Blessed Virgin Mary. And what strikes me so much about this mystery is that Mary, who was conceived without original sin, that's what the Immaculate Conception refers to, then was a human being who went through life never being envious, never being selfish, never being resentful or cynical. She was a person possessed of the most perfect purity who um, must have found in some respects dealing with the others in the world kind of strange and maybe even painful because everyone else is fallen. Everyone else has concupiscence and concupiscence is, is when we, we use our sense appetite to go after things that are not uh, according to reason. So Mary was never tempted to overeat. No, Mary didn't have any of those kinds of, of temptations that we have, but she was surrounded by those people. And she must have felt at times a little strange, a little odd, wondering why she was so different. What was, why was she given this different humanity? So the day that the angel appears to her is a day of great confirmation for her because she recognizes that in what the angel is saying, it all makes sense. She has been made this way for this moment so that she could make her fiat, her yes, by which the Son of God would become flesh in her womb. And that would be the beginning of the end. Because what, what all of us, or the beginning of the beginning, because what all of us want in our, in our hearts is for the infinite to come very close to us. Because we're really made for that. We're made for the infinite. You know, nothing finite really satisfies us. We always want something more. And in our hearts, we're, we're always striving for a way to reach that infinite something that we're looking for. And in the Annunciation, God says, I am going to make the infinite as close to you as, your, as, as a companion. I'm going to make the infinite flesh. And so that's why the church has the beautiful tradition of praying the Angelus three times a day. The Angelus, which is a prayer that recounts the event of what happened when the angel appeared to Mary, when, when, when the Son of God took flesh in her womb, and when he was born of the Virgin Mary. Because as much as I want the infinite to come close to me, I, I don't know that it's ever really, really going to happen, but it has happened in Mary. And so maybe if I beg her, if I stay close to her, what happened to her will happen to me in a different way, but a way that's just as, as effective and, and powerful and, and, and moving for me. Yeah, we need to have Jesus come into our lives yeah, like close. he came into her life. Yes. And to, to truly, you know, give, uh, like St. Augustine said, our hearts, you know, are just longing and yeah. they're restless yeah. until they rest in God. And that's what we need. But one of the things we also need to do is rest uh, for now because it's time for a break. So we're going to be back in a couple of minutes. And we want to get your questions and your comments as well as those of our studio audience. So please stay with us.
Welcome back. It's uh, great to have a nice audience here from different parts of the country. Uh, they've, they've joined us as, as smaller groups, and we'd love to have you come and join us. Whether you come as a big group with your parish or from your diocese, or uh, you come as an individual or as a family, we more than welcome having you come and be part of our studio audience. If you can, please contact our pilgrimage department at 205-271-2966. as 205-271-2966. Or go to our website, www.ewtn.com. And you can find out more information. They'll help you with where you can stay. There are places in the, the nearby area where you can, uh, hotels and such. They'll let you know the schedules for the masses, the programs, tours of the network, et cetera, as well as give you a map to get up to Hansville to see the sisters, who, by the way, I want you to keep praying for. They still don't have electricity up there. Uh, the storms were more uh, harsh up in that part of Alabama than they were down here in Irondale. So please keep uh, them in your, in your prayers, as well as the rest of the people of Alabama. But come on down and join us if you can. And Father, I also want to mention that you are the editor-in-chief of the Magnificat magazine. Yes. This is a great little tool for a lot of people to, to use. A lot of, we sell out every month uh, here at the gift shop. Oh, that's great to hear. Yeah, 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 we always do. Uh, how long have you been working with Magnificat? I've been working with Magnificat since the beginning, which was 1998. Okay. Yeah. And, you know, if you want to find out more about the Magnificat magazine, it has the readings of the Mass, it has the Mass text, it has daily prayers from the office, uh, the, the Liturgy of the Hours, uh, for both morning prayer and evening prayer, correct? Yes. They're adapted, but... Yeah, yes. they're adapted. Right. It's a shortened version That's of it, right. but it's a way to get started. That's right. And, be, and you can go from there to maybe reading the, more of the Liturgy of the Hours. Yeah. Uh, it's a great way to start off with keeping up with Mass on a daily basis as well, uh, especially if you're watching Mass here on EWTN, you can have the readings with you. Uh, and also a little inspirational quotes from the fathers and from other people. Uh, the website is www.magnificat.com, magnificat.com. And you can find out more about it and maybe even order it. Because uh, they, they can subscribe to it and get it sent to them, right? Yes, and get a sample copy as well. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. That's going to be very useful in November. Yes. When we make the switch to the new translation of the liturgy. Yes, you're right. Yes. And people will be able to have a copy of what the liturgy is supposed to be. And you'll be able to follow along. And that'll be very useful. And in Magnificat, in these months uh, leading up to the November transition, we're publishing little essays on different aspects of the change to the liturgy. To Good. help prepare our people, yeah. Good, because that's yeah. a great way to be prepared. Yeah. Speaking of prepared, are you ready for some uh, calls and questions? I'll, I'll give it a shot. All right. We have Dan on the line. Hello, Dan. Hi, Father. Hi. Where are you from? I'm from Connecticut. Good. That's the Father's neck yeah, of the woods. I, I have a question for, um, uh, for Father. Um, it's often been said, or I should say I've, I've read often, that Mary might be the connecting factor between Christianity and Islam. And often they'll refer to the fact that Mary holds a very prominent place uh, uh, in the Quran, and, and they even make reference to the fact that Our Lady appeared in Fatima, a town that was named uh, after Muhammad's daughter. I, I was just wondering if uh, you could comment on that. Well, it's an excellent question. I, I confess I don't know. I have not heard this before, so uh, I can't say anything too authoritative. But what I know is this, that... The reason why Jesus is not well enough known, and this goes back to St. Louis de Montfort, is because the Blessed Virgin Mary is not known well enough. And that the more we come to know the Blessed Virgin Mary, the more we come to know Jesus. Because in knowing Jesus, we want to love him. And it's impossible for us to love Jesus the way he deserves, the way that is, um, in a, with a love that is a kind of a totalizing love, unless we love our Lord with the love of the heart of the Blessed Virgin Mary because no one was capable of loving him with the kind of purity and the kind of completeness that Mary did. 
So, and does. And so it makes sense to me that, um, that the, the, the union between the religion of Islam and Christianity will have at the root the Blessed Virgin Mary, because I know that Mary does appear in the Quran. I just can't, as I say, speak authoritatively at all about the role that she plays. But Mary's role in bringing us closer to, in our knowledge of Jesus Christ and in our embrace of his love, absolutely. As a matter of fact, the Blessed Virgin Mary is the only woman mentioned by name in the whole Quran. Yeah. No other woman is mentioned by name, not even Muhammad's mother is mentioned by name, nor any other woman uh, is mentioned by name, only the Virgin Mary. And they understand that she's a virgin. Now, there are some points of confusion. For instance, they think that we think that Mary is the third person of the Trinity. And that's one of the things that we need to make, let, let Muslims know. We don't believe that. This has never been the teaching of the church. Uh, maybe there was some heretical group that they came across in the time of Muhammad uh, and that they were speaking against. And we would speak against it too because we deny that she's the third person of the Trinity, that she's not part of the Trinity. She's a creature like us. Hmm. But uh, if you're interested, at my website, fathermitchpakwa.org, I have a CD series on Mary in the Quran, uh, Mary and the Eucharist in the Quran. Uh, so you might take a look at that and get some more insight into it. Ready for another question? Sure. We have a gentleman here from our studio audience. Sir, where are you from? I'm from Kansas City, Missouri. Good to have you here. And what's your question? I've got two. Uh, the first question is, your book, <clears throat> would it be of value in talking to my Protestant friends about Mary? And your second question? second one is, why has Mary not... You'd think she would write a book about all the history that she spent with our, our Lord. And if you know, if you can comment on why we haven't heard much from Mary after, uh, you know, the uh, crucifixion. Thank you. Well, I, I think that um, in answering the first question, the book is, uh, is very appropriate for giving to our, our Protestant brethren. Because when I was writing the book, I tried to write it from the point of view of someone who really doesn't know very much about the Blessed Mother. I just, I use that as the presupposition. Um, and, and so I, I try to build the argument for the Blessed Virgin Mary, if you will, from the most um, basic um, facts. And so I think in the process, what the book uh, attempts to do is to show how what God provides for us in the Blessed Virgin Mary responds to what we need in our own human experience. That what uh, is given to us in devotion to the Mother of God is not an add-on to the faith, but rather it is something very crucial, vital, it's indispensable to the living out of, of Christianity. And so I hope that the book would, would show how um, so it's, it's not a pietistic book in that respect at all. So I, I'm hoping the book would show how these mysteries correspond to something that I'm looking for in my own heart. And now that makes sense because of the way that it's been provided for us in the role of the Blessed Mother. So As a matter of fact, so. I intend to pass my copy on to a convert friend of mine. Oh, wow. Thank you. Who, uh, you know, you know, still is learning. You know, he, he has no problem with devotion to the Blessed Mother, but it never was part of the life. He came from a, a free church tradition, and it was never part of his mentality. And so this will help him to understand, yeah. you know, this, this uh, the devotion to Mary and give new insights, you know, from Scripture and the Fathers. And that's one of the things he's very interested in, because Good, yeah. how the church worshipped in the early centuries is something that's very important to him. He wants to have a consistency and and you bring that out by showing how the fathers of the church, you know, have a devotion to Mary. Yes. The second and question. For the second question, well, I, I guess we could say that um, once someone gives birth to the word of God, writing a book about him is sort of downhill. But, <laughs> but there really, there's, a, 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 I think, a very beautiful um, answer to this excellent question, which is that um, don't be deceived. 
Um, there's more of Mary in the New Testament than you might know. For example, the, the event of the Annunciation is an event that happened between the Blessed Virgin Mary and the Archangel Gabriel in the privacy of her own house. You know, may, maybe Anna was in the next room, we don't know. But those were the only witnesses to this event, right? Right. So how do we know about this? And the only way that we could know about it is if the Mother of God told us this. Right. You know? So at one point, after the Lord rose from the dead, when the apostles were assembled with Mary, as they were, as we know from, the Pen from Pentecost, Mary must have looked at those men and said, there's something that you need to know, and it's very important for your living out of your faith with my son. This is how he came to be in my womb. And Luke was very struck by it, so he decided to immediately put it into his gospel. As a matter of fact, one of the things that you see in the whole nat nativity narratives in Luke's gospel is that unlike his customary top quality Greek, really? it's in barbaric Greek. It's, it's clearly reflecting an Aramaic original. Yeah. And that uh, throughout the, the, those first two chapters, yeah. there's an Aramaic original that he sometimes translates very literally, like uh, when Elizabeth says, blessed are you among women. That's an Aramaism. That's not good Greek. Uh, it means you're the most blessed woman. But it's an Aramaic idiom. And there are a lot of other Aramaic idioms throughout the, those first two chapters that uh, are not good Greek. He apparently had an Aramaic original that he brought into the Greek language and mm. did sometimes translate it rather slavishly. Mm -hmm. But it would, it's your point is well taken. How would we know about the stories of John the Baptist's birth? Yeah. He couldn't tell the apostles because no. they didn't know him. He was put in prison before they started doing any writing right. and then he was killed. Right. So it, all of that has to come from her. There's another theory that the prologue to John's gospel was, um, was shared by the Blessed Virgin Mary with John. So we know at the cross when Jesus gives uh, Mary to John and, and John to Mary, and it says that the beloved disciple took Mary into his home, obviously there was a great kinship between the Blessed Virgin Mary and, and John, and the, the way that they spoke about Jesus and what they shared about the Lord must have been uh, mystical beyond imagining. So there is one theory that at one point the Blessed Virgin Mary turned to John and said to him, in the beginning was my son. My son was, my son was, the, the word was in the beginning and my son was that word. And that John listening to that took the words of the Blessed Virgin Mary and transformed that into what we have as the prologue. Speaking of John, we have a caller named John. Hello, John. Hello, Father. Hi, where are you from? Ohio. Good to have you on. And what's your question? Good to be on. Um, <clears throat> you know, the Dominicans have a great devotion to Mary, and Father Peter is just exhibiting that so well. Uh, to comment on the question, uh, Blessed John Paul the Great and Blessed Mother Teresa of Calcutta made the St. Louis de Montfort consecration to Jesus through Mary. And obviously we can figure if we can have that love and mystery of Mary, it's going to really demand a response. And I did not live in a home where we did the daily rosary or anything like that. And I was involved in the charismatic renewal, so occasionally Mary was there. But I started thinking, hey, if all these appearances and everything, you know, this is pretty black and white. It's something very good or something very evil. And uh, Father had mentioned St. Louis de Montfort before, so I feel great asking this. Is that consecration something in, in your life, Father Peter? And is it something that we could uh, ask people to do as a response to God and Mary's great love for us? And I'll hang up. Thank I you, John. 
Thank you, John. I think the De Montfort consecration is magnificent. I have not done it myself yet because I, it, it requires very intensive preparation and I want to be in a place that I can give myself to that 100%. But some of my Dominican brothers recently have just made consecration. Actually, some of our novices, they sent me a photograph of uh, the day that they took the consecration and it meant so much to me that it really is spurring me on to want to do that myself. Um, and I, what Louis, de, for me, the, the great work of, of, of Marian spirituality is Louis de Montfort, True Devotion to the Blessed Virgin Mary. It just, yeah, it's True Devotion un, to the Blessed Virgin yeah, Mary is a great book. Yeah, unsurpassed, yeah. 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 All right, so you have another caller, Jimmy. Hello? Hi. Hi, uh, where are you from? Uh, New Jersey. Good to have you, and what's your question? Uh, I have a question. Why are the um, other denominations, Protestant denominations, uh, anti-Catholic denominations, so uh, have such an aversion to the Blessed Mother? Well, I think, well, thank you for your question. I think the answer is because they, they don't understand her role. Um, Mary is the model of the church. And very often, the way one loves and regards the Blessed Virgin Mary is a sign of how much they esteem and regard the church itself. So it's not, it's not uh, uncommon for um, a kind of um, an animosity or a, um, uh, a confusion about the Blessed Virgin Mary also to be uh, ev made evident in um, the way that people just look at the church itself. But as we were saying before in answering another question, I, I think very often it's because of misperceptions people have about the Blessed Mother. That's why in the book I try to start again from the perspective of what do I need in order to live my relationship with God? And once I see that and I experience that in my own life, I see how much I really do need Mary in my life. You know, for example, in, uh, in uh, the last caller talked about the apparitions. I mean, there really is a beautiful scriptural foundation for the apparitions of the Blessed Virgin Mary, and it is the mystery that we made reference to before, which is the visitation. Because what happens in the visitation is that Mary goes and is physically present to a, a little one in need to help her with the presence of, of, of God in Jesus that she bears in her womb. And all of the apparitions do this. I think the, the visitation of the Blessed Virgin Mary, as it's recounted in the Gospel of Luke, is really the scriptural foundation for, for the way that Mary constantly through the ages has come back to us, placing before us the mysteries of her son so as to move us simply to look at them with, uh, with eyes that, that maybe we wouldn't be moved to look at unless there's a mother goading us to do it, moving us to look at these mysteries and, and seeing that it's really what I've been looking for in my life, what's been lacking. I think uh, another thing that a lot of non-Catholics are concerned about is that Jesus will be neglected. They sometimes fear yeah. that if we focus on Mary, then we won't focus on the Lord Jesus. And they'll want to come to him because so much of the spirituality of Protestants is that they've experienced salvation. They've experienced a forgiveness of sins by coming to Christ on the cross. Mm -hmm. And they fear that Mary will get in the way of that or become a distraction. And I think that that's another concern that a number of them have. And again, to, to find the answer, the, the good answer to that concern, <laughs> God bless you, the, the best thing to do is, again, to look at our own experience. So, for example, if I am developing a friendship with you, Father Mitch, at a certain point, I'm going to ask you, well, well, tell me about your family. Tell me about where you're from, etc. And, you know, if you tell me that you have a mother and she doesn't live far away, then I'm going to say, well, let, let me go and meet your mother. You know, right. I mean, and... And you're not going to say to me, no, no, you're not going to meet my mother. And, and if you were to say that to me, I'd say, well, there's something strange about that. Because uh, not only is meeting your mother simply a natural part of the way that friendship grows, 
if I don't meet your mother because you come from her and she, she raised you and so many of your beautiful personality traits are from her, if you don't, if you don't share her with me, then we can't be really be very good friends, that there's something about knowing her. And when I get to know your mother, she's not gonna say to me, okay, you can't be friends with my son anymore. She's gonna say, no, be, be, be a, a dear close friend of my, my son. And it's possible in a, in a much truer, richer way, precisely because I've gotten to know this one who is so important in your own heart. If I don't know the one who is so dear in your own heart, how can I love your heart? I often use the example of uh, the relationship between a bride and groom, yes. which is that of the marriage, and they're, they're married to each other, right. but you always have the in-laws. Yes. And this is, part of the, you, this is part of the family. Unless you find an orphan, right. you marry the whole family. Uh -huh. You know, and all the married people are laughing because they know, you know, yeah. and that can be for better or for worse. Yeah. But you hope that the relationship with the in-laws makes the marriage better. And you get a lot of insight from your spouse because moms will tell on you. <laughs> Let's go to another caller. We have Melissa on the line. Hello, Melissa. Hey, Father. How are you? Fine. Where are you from? Florida. Good to have you on. And what's your question? Well, um, my question is, in the Garden of Eden, after Eve was tempted and ate of the fruit, God told her that she would have pain in childbirth and her monthly menstruals. And we know Mary was born with that original sin through the Immaculate Conception. How then can she still suffer the effects of Eve's original sin with pain of childbirth and her monthly menstruals? And, you know, the, part of this is in the um, book of Revelation. It is in chapter 12, it describes, you know, the pains of childbirth going on. So that's where that, that kind of question oftentimes comes from. The only uh, fitting answer to that question, again, we have to find by looking at our own experience and also looking at the experience of the Lord. So, for example, uh, our Lord in his human life, and so our Lord was perfectly sinless, but our Lord experienced hunger, he experienced thirst, he experienced the need to sleep, he got tired when he was walking, etc. He experienced grief when Lazarus grief, died. Yes, and John the Baptist. So uh, this is not, but none of these conditions are the result of fallenness. None of these um, human experiences that Christ underwent were the result of some flaw or fall in, in our Lord's past. And so too with the Blessed Virgin Mary, that to the degree that she shares in the conditions of other natural mothers, it is there not as a, a result of uh, an effect of sin, but as a way of uniting herself more mm -hmm. deeply. Okay. All right, good. And you know, this is one of the things um, that, you know, we're dealing with the mystery of the incarnation. You know, Christ had to suffer death. Yes. And, you know, and we, we see him undergoing that, even though he was sinless, uh, death was another result of the fall. Exactly. But he underwent that in order to redeem us from the fall. Yes. And that, that, that so many times innocent people suffer, mm -hmm. but they, when they offer that suffering up for salvation in union with Jesus, then it has this redemptive element. So that's, yeah. that's another point that we have to deal with as well. Mm. We have just a few seconds left. Uh, I want people to make sure that they know about your book. It's called Mysteries of the Virgin Mary, Living Our Lady's Graces. It's by Father Peter John Cameron. Now you can get this from EW10's Religious Catalog at 1-800-854. 6316. That's 1-800-854-6316. Or go to the website, ww10 And while you're at it, order my new book on listening to God. <laughs> let's, let's, let's keep the plugs going here. The religious catalog has all that. Father, I want to thank you very much thank for joining you, us. Mr. Appreciate it. And uh, if you would, I'd like you to join me in blessing our, our audience. Almighty God bless you and keep you and cause his face to shine upon you. 
by the intercession of the Blessed Virgin Mary, lead you to all grace. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. And I want to remind you, we can bring Father here to do this program, and we can do all the other programs we do, because this network is brought to you by you. You make it possible for us to do this. So please keep us in between your gas bill, your electric bill, and your cable bill, and we'll be able to pay all of our bills. God bless you and thank you.